Okay, good morning. It's uh, Peter here from AJS, and it's my pleasure to once again bring you another online demonstration in a of workshop somewhere around Australia. And this week we're coming to you, as you can see, from sunny Geelong. And we have the one and only Chris Sherwin back with us again. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Peter. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you, Chris. And it is nice and sunny where you are, so that's great. And I'm sure we've got a lovely... Uh, we have a demonstration in store today, and it is decorative design using wire. Can you explain what that's all about? Absolutely. Thanks, Peter. Yes, we are streaming from uh, sunny Geelong today. Beautiful spring day. I think it's our second day of spring. So today we're going to cover some technical aspects, talking about draw plates, what they are and how they work do a few demonstrations and then we're going to make up some uh, decorative wire and I'll show you a few things I've made with some decorative wire. So welcome everybody and uh, yeah, hope, hope we have a, bit of, a good session there. What sort of tools are we going to be using? So we're going to be using what are called draw plates. I've got quite a few here. They are uh, silver, silver plates, uh, uh, sorry, tool steel plates. I've already lost the plot today. And these plates allow you to pull wire through them to different sizes and shapes. So this is a round wire draw plate. This is a triangular draw plate. Uh, you can have half round, square, square holes. And, uh, and this is uh, what's called the tungsten draw plate, tungsten carbide. So they're, they're, it's a round holes, but the inserts to allow the wire to come through the back uh, made from tungsten carbide, which is a, a hardened material, and that helps produce shiny, bright wire. So effectively what we're doing is we're taking uh, a round, round material, stock gauge round material, which I've probably all drawn out. So we're taking wire basically, and we are drawing it through various holes on the plate to produce a particular shape and a particular size uh, and dimension of wire. Uh, I might just hold this plate up to the, to, the, to the camera here and it will give you an idea of the different hole sizes on the plate. You can see the reduction there from one millimetre on this plate, working your way along, reducing down, dropping down a row, working your way back, etc., until you get to the very bottom and the very last hole in this plate is around about 0.1 of a millimetre. You can just see a little speck there. And it's <laughs> very small. Yeah, and I don't think I've ever got my wire through there. Uh, it's very hard to draw wire down below about 0.2 of a millimetre. It's extremely difficult. So that's a round plate. And just to show you again, just show you the shape shapes. This is for triangular wire. And again, you're starting from the larger size working your way down, dropping down a row and working your way back. And you can stop at any point on the plate when you've got nice precision wire at the size that you need it. And just a quick view of that tungsten plate. These are, these are really good plates. You can get these at AJS. This is tungsten carbide. If you're going to invest in any tungsten plates, they are a little bit more expensive. The round ones are the ones to get. And this one, you can see it's actually measured from, what do we start? 2.2 millimetres down this end. And you can just see the holes there and you work your way all the way down to 1.05 millimetres at this other end here. So it's graduation down by 0.05 at a time and uh, you get beautiful polished wire from that plate. So I definitely recommend that if you get round plates, you uh, you buy tungsten ones because they last forever. I've had this plate for 30 years. They're beautiful. Wow, it looks brand new. Yeah, it looks, looks new. That's been well used. used. <laughs> so you need to look after your plates. They are hard and steel. Uh, you need to lubricate the wire when you pull it through and we'll, we'll, we'll sort of do a quick demonstration now of how the plates actually work. So if I take my... This is my smaller plate, one mil down to, to, to about uh, 0.1. I'm just gonna grab a piece of wire. I've got so many samples here, so you'll have to excuse me if I seem a bit vague today. Just gotta keep my eye on where everything is. I've 
pull this wire down to about 0.65. I'm just going to show you how it's drawn out. So that's already at 0.65, it's quite fine. And I'm going to draw that through the plate. And I've got, I've already filed what's called a spit on the end of the wire there. So it's a very fine point to allow me to enter the plate from the back. And I'll just see which hole that will go through. Too far down. I think that's the right one there. It is, I'm just gonna file the spit a little bit tighter. So you have to have a taper at the front of your wire to get it to go through the plate. And you'll need some sensitive pliers. So pliers with a little bit of grip at the front to grab onto your wire. Change up to my Rolls-Royce specs. And let's see if I can get this through the right hole. Too big. I think that's the one I want to go through. So I'll just show you that. So I've got the wire coming in from the back of the plate. So there's the back of the plate, very large openings at the back. And you'll see the wires being pushed through the back and it comes through to the front. And I'll just turn the plate. You can just see the tip of the wire coming through the front of the plate there just a small amount of the wire. And that's gonna allow me to get on with my pliers, grab the wire and draw the wire through that hole. So I'm gonna do that now, my vise at the back here. I'm gonna put the, uh, the plate into the, into the vise. So I've got something strong to hold, hold the plate. And when you're drawing wire, you should always apply a little bit of wax to your wire. So it lubricates it, so it reduces the wear on the plate and it allows the wire to come through cleanly. There are a couple of tricks to lubricating your wire. I can show you those in a second. Just make sure there's a little bit of wax on that wire. Now that wire is fully annealed. I'm gonna grab the front of the wire that's coming through the front of the plate with the pliers. I've gone through the first hole. Oh, it's got, got the sun in my eyes here, Peter. Yeah. It's incredibly bright. And then we'll find the next hole down. Here we go. Grab that. And as I pull the wire through, the wire is going to stretch and squeeze at the same time. And it will become longer. And it did, it did flick out, but it actually is effectively straighter, that wire. It takes all the kinks out of the wire. So that wire is now probably 0.55 or 0.6. It was 0.65 and it's down to just a bit under 0.6 of a millimetre in diameter. So that's how you draw your wire down through the plate. Now, just talk a little bit about the technical aspects of drawing wire down. It fascinates me, it probably doesn't fascinate anyone else though. Wire drawing is a really, specific type of mechanical function. A lot of people think that drawing wire is just like crushing metal in a rolling mill. In fact, this is not quite true. Wire drawing is really very interesting because when you pull on the wire, you are stretching the metal and you are tearing the fabric of the metal apart. But when the wire goes through the plate, it's being squeezed through the hole. So as it comes through the plate, you're actually mechanically working it as you are in a rolling mill where you're crushing the wire down and you are actually making the wire stronger. So you're doing two things at the same time. You're crushing the wire, making it finer and smaller, but you're pulling the wire, which means you're stretching it and tearing it. And so, it's really important to understand mechanically what you're doing because a lot of people draw wire down and they don't understand why it keeps snapping and breaking and they don't. It takes a long time to understand when you should anneal your wire. When is it, when is it too tough to pull? 
Why does it keep snapping? When should I anneal the wire? So there's a lot to learn about using draw plates and about manipulating a material. Very interesting concept. And just for those of you who like history, draw plates, we know that goldsmithing is a 10,000 year old tradition and, and, and we all use hand tools and hammers and files. We've been using those for thousands of years, but draw plates uh, have only been around for a couple of hundred years. So when you see all that ancient Egyptian and Etruscan beautiful filigree work and whatnot, all that wire was drawn through timber and then maybe copper before steel was invented. So the evolution of the mechanics of drawing wire is really a very modern evolution. What, what ancient people did was pretty, pretty amazing when you think of the limited tools. So thanks for that. Very technical. So we've drawn our wire out and normally you'd pull that out three, four, five, six, eight, ten 10 holes until it's work hardened. And then you would anneal your wire to go to the next stage of, of fabrication to make decorative wire. So round wire is easy. Round wire is where we all start. Uh, it teaches you a lot about jewellery. As I said, it teaches you a lot about how the plates function and how when to anneal your wire, soften it. Chris, could you just remind us on the definition of annealing? Okay, so annealing is after you've worked hardened, once you've done work to something, you've drawn it out, you've rolled it out, you've hammered it out, it's become hard. Annealing is that process of heating the material, which allows the molecules to uh, basically move to an area, and the electrons to move within the substance so that the substance becomes soft again. So annealing is a softening process. Uh, as you work metal, it gets harder and harder and harder till it splits. When you anneal metal, you actually allow the metal to relax back to its stable state, and that allows you to keep working again. Beautiful. Thank you. So we'll do a bit of annealing in a moment. So I've, we've made round wire, pretty straightforward making just round wire. Now I buy a wire in two and a half mil round, two mil round, 1.5, one mil. So that when I do draw hand draw, because I'm a hand maker, then I'm already fairly close at where I want to finish at. There's no point in having a big chunk of metal and wanting to draw out a little wire like this, which you can hardly see. Uh, it's too much time wasting. So you always want to start as close as you can to where you want to finish. That's round wire. Round wire is simple. So if you're going to make square wire, you've got to start probably round or start with the roll profile from your rolling mills and then go to your square plate. So if you can, you can square roll your wire, you can then go to your square plate and immediately start drawing it in closer to a square shape. So I've drawn some square wire. And once you've drawn any of your material or you've, you've worked your material, you, you will need to anneal it. So if we went through an annealing cycle, I'll, I'll skip the annealing cycle because we'll do some annealing in a moment. I've got some wire, round wire here. I want to show you how to make a decorative, simple twisted wire. This, is, this has been annealed. It's about 0.65. It's quite long because you need a lot of wire to make something decorative. You can't work with a short shape. And you have to remember that mathematically, if this wire is 0.65 and I'm going to twist it together, it's going to be 1.2 in diameter when I finish. It's going to double in size. And this is another interesting point to remember is that when you're making wire, it might seem you're making very delicate, very fine shapes. But when you start twisting it together, it starts to double and triple in size. So what can be you know, very simple wire can end up quite thick after you've, you've done uh, your decorative twist to it. So here's my annealed wire. I'm going to double it over. In other words, I'm just going to take the wire, find the two ends, bring the two ends together, and then pull the wire straight as I can and make a little kink at that end. And that's the, the end I'm going to put into my vise. So using my soft jaws, I'm going to pull the wire straight and then I'm going to use some vice grips to hold that wire and then I'm going to start twisting the wire. So you'll just you'll see me working away in the background here. 
And if you want to ask Peter any questions while I'm doing this, go ahead. So you will, why it has to be a kneel to start. And put a number of people on board, uh, Chris. The title of our demonstration today is decorative design using wire, but it looks as though Guido thinks it's decorative design using wine because he's got a few wine glasses in his little comments. Using wine, yeah. yeah. No, I, I do my decorative design with wine in the evenings when I finish working, but yeah, I can I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> is that Guido? Yeah. Do you know Guido? Oh, I do indeed, yeah. No, that's okay. <laughs> We're on the same page. <laughs> so it's important to keep those wires taut. You can't have one a bit wavy and the other one very tight. They have to be tight together if you want a lovely decorative uh, control pattern. Little vice grips, very, very handy. Uh, you can use your parallel pliers, but the vice grips lock on really nicely if you adjust them. Click them on. And I've now got my wire sitting across here nice and straight. I'm pulling it gently. And then I'm twisting the wire in one direction. As I continue to pull gently, I'm twisting the wire clockwise. And that wire starts to twist. Now, as that wire twists up, of course, it's going to work hard. So again, experience, um, good annealing, will get you a good result. So I pull on the wire gently, twist the wire, and I'm probably gonna end up with a twist every centimeter, I'd say, or under before I stop twisting. If you continue to twist forever, the wire will break, and then you'll have to start all over again. I've oh, just lost my tip, I'll get rid of that. And I can already tell that I haven't annealed this wire well because I've got different amounts of twist happening in my wire. So I've already been a bad person. <laughs> but I'll show you. Okay, that should be about enough. If I go much further than that, it's going to snap. Just release that from the drawer plate. If you don't mind switching cameras there, Peter, I can show people where we've got to here. This is the little end that I'm sacrificing in my vise. These are the two round wires together, and you'll see the twist happening there. I'll try to hold it still. And as I work down the wire, it's nice and even, nice and even, nice and even, and then suddenly it gets uneven. You can see this area in here has not twisted as well as the area up here. But this is nice and even. And then suddenly it's not as heavily twisted, especially at the end. So you can, you can see how important it is to, to pull very tight on your wire and kneel it evenly to get a nice even twist. Nonetheless, that, that will eventually get me a great piece of wire. Okay, I've got to this point and I've decided it's time to anneal the wire and because I know that if, if you under twist it and you stop and you anneal, your wire will, un will unravel. And again, you'll have to start in, from the beginning. So you do have to know, you have to get a reasonable twist on the wire before you stop. I'm now going to make a circle out of that. Hope that wasn't too quick for people. Quick circle. Like a magician. That's it. And fold the ends in so they're tucked in. They're not sticking out. And then I can put that onto my mat, ready, ready for annealing. I've got lots of samples here. I've already prepared stuff. So let me get a piece that's annealed. What have I got in the way of round that's annealed? So much wire, I can't see it. Here we go. This is a bigger, this is a bigger strip. Well, that's work hard too. So what I'll do is I'll anneal these, apply my flux. So the sort of wire I like to work with is either twisted round. I also work a lot with square wire twisted and with rectangular wire, and they give you quite interesting effects and shapes. I've got a couple of samples to show you in a second. So I just flux these very carefully with the brassic. Just 
So they remain nice and clean. Especially with wire working, because you're trying to create something with a bit of a sparkly effect. Now, a lot of people won't know this, but there's, there is a reason why design has gone the way it's gone. Just burn off my metho there. I've got a larger wire here, the straight section I'm annealing now. That's done. I'm using a big flame, but a soft flame. Notice it's still a little bit orange on the end. Very, very easy to melt your wire, but it's important to twist it like I did in a circle when it's a long length. That way you can reduce the chance of burning your wire and melting it. And you'll see the wire moving as this tension comes out of it. It actually stretches and releases. Sounds like you're doing a yoga class there. It is. It's. It, I tell you what. It's mental yoga. If, <laughs> if you if you lose track of what you're doing, you end up with a big melted blob. Could you please um, uh, remind everyone why you flux to a needle? Please, yes, I'm fluxing just to reduce the amount of uh, oxidation and burning of the surface. I don't want the, the wire to go black uh, because of the, the effects of fire scale. In this case, the fire scale won't matter. You wouldn't be removing fire scale from your wire, but it just keeps your, your, your material nice and, nice and shiny. It protects the metal. Thank it's you. Shiny. So, yeah, talking about history, we're... So before the days of um, diamond cluster rings and, you know, you've got all your, your, your main diamond and you've got all your little diamonds around it, I'll just show you a couple of samples I've got here. This is a, a ruby ring I made 35 years ago, actually, a long time ago. And this has wire around, this, around the ruby. It's a, a cabochon ruby, very sort of Etruscan looking in style you know, Romanesque, if you like, with the shoulders and the little, the little beads. But this wire is, is just a decorative, twisted, rectangular wire. Uh, I'll show you a sample of that right now. This is an oversized sample. That's just a rectangle of wire. Looks like a bit of um, uh, licorice. Didn't you get licorice in that shape once? You did, yep. So it's just a rectangular wire. If you look at the profile, it's a rectangle. And if it's twisted nicely in the draw, in the um, vise, as I did before, just a single wire, it's not doubled over like the last one. This is just a single piece of rectangular wire turned into a barley twist, if you like. And that's exactly the decorative wire going around this ruby. And when I was talking about history before, what people forget is before we had lots of little diamonds, you know, you can imagine this being a diamond ring with a big diamond and lots of little diamonds around the outside. Mm -hmm. That's where that came from. It came from this design because the wire has little highlights of, you see the little highlights of the light hitting the wire, sparkly, yeah. if you like. You get the shape of the wire, but you get the little highlights. That's exactly where the idea came from to sprinkle diamonds around a ring. It came from this three, four, 5,000 year old style because by keeping your wire clean when you anneal, and polishing afterwards, you get these shadows and highlights around your stone or around your shape, and it creates that busy effect in your eyes. So that's that's the beginning, if you like, of a cluster ring, historically. But the decorative part is really quite nice. It just gives it a little extra extra boost rather than just a plain top. Yeah, lovely ring, Chris. Another, another sample here. Uh, While you're getting uh, that, Wayne has asked, um, do you let the wire cool or do you quench it after the needle? Uh, definitely quench it when you're annealing, especially, yeah, and you should really quench all of your wires unless they're white gold. So this is a uh, big marbe, marbe pearl and a green moonstone, lovely, nice oval moonstone. You've got the round marbe and you've got the oval moonstone and they both have 
a square wire around them. So this is a silver ring with a gold wire and a gold bezel. So you can see the color shift there, the color around the stone, the color around the pearl, you get that slight yellowing effect, but then the ring itself you can see is sterling silver. But what the wire does is it really draws your attention to what's in the middle, in the, in the stone area, and it creates that sort of business, busyness with the eyes, if you like. So yeah, that's Chris, that. Um, we seem to have a technical issue. Yeah. Uh, video is frozen. Okay. Um, I'll just go back to you of the, uh, the laptop and just see if that has any difference. I'll keep working away here. Oh, it's okay now. We've got the okay now. All good. Okay, so I've got my wire out of the pickle. These these have both been annealed now. I've got my uh, my round wire, which was the fine 0.65, which was on part of the journey to becoming a twisted wire. And I've got my earlier sample of twisted wire, which I which I made earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist that wire a little bit a little bit more. So back into the vice. Get my vice grips. Lock that up and twist that further. And remember to keep twisting in the same direction. Don't untwist your wire. Good tip, Chris. Sorry? Good tip. Good tip, yeah. Don't, don't untwist what you've already done. Now, some people have strop, they actually strop their wire with timber to try to, um, to keep the twist even. There are little tricks you can use to keep your, your twist even, but the, the most important one is to pull, draw consistently, anneal consistently. Don't overheat sections of your wire. And this is getting a really lovely twist on it now. And you might do this two, three, maybe even up to four times annealing and twisting. Depends on how tight you want your twist to be, but I'm really happy with this now. So, so is experience the biggest teacher as to how far to go? I think so. I think you really have to have the odd mistake until you realize how far you can push it. And you know, a bit of silver wire, it's not that expensive. Get yourself some you know, 0.6 or 0.8, draw it down to point. 65 or 0.6, give it a go. That's coming up really beautifully now. It's uh, got about twice the amount of twist on it. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite springy. Really lovely twist as opposed to what we probably had earlier. So I've got about twice as many twists per centimetre, if you like. And you just notice how spring it is and, and, and how straight that wire actually is now that I've drawn it and then twisted it in the draw plate. Really lovely. It's the uniformity which gives it the beauty too. It is, it's the uniformity. It's exactly right. This is, this is what's true in everything in design. If your eyes settle on a very even pattern, uh, it's, it's very pleasing and, and your eyes always are drawn to the mistakes, which are the ununiform bits. So I could keep twisting that and end up with something eventually that would look, oh, here's, a, here's a, a very fine piece here. This is super fine. So I guess that's the last stage. Uh, if we could show those again, Peter, on the, on the camera. Yeah, sure. Looks as though we've lost our internet again, but just keep going. And, uh... Okay. So we've, we've got the three stages. This is a heavier wire, but we've got the, the light twist, the one I've just been working on, this, this medium twist, and then if we compare that to the, the, the little one in my hand there, super fine twist, very, very tight. I'll have to get a bit closer to the camera if I can. You can just see how tight that little twist is. And it, it, it really comes down to the design you're using, the size of stone, the size of wire, just how much detail you want to give. So that's round wire. Uh, obviously you have to have two wires to twist up a lovely twisted round wire. But let's get now onto the rectangular and square wire. So if I've drawn wire square using the draw plate, I'm going to start with a, a dead square piece of wire. It's just 
square and profile. And when I twist that, I get a completely different pattern. I don't actually have to double this up. I can, but if I, if I just twist it evenly, if you could perhaps show that uh, on, the, on the camera, Peter. Sorry, I'm getting you to jump around a bit. There you go. There's your square wire at the bottom. And there is the same wire with a simple twist on it. It gives you these lovely highlights, really, really beautiful wire, uh, just simply by twisting a square. And similar is true for the rectangle. I'll show you that while we're there. This is actually rectangular wire with a lighter twist, and it also has these lovely highlights on it. So you end up with you know, quite, quite a spectacular effect. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's covered quite a bit. How are we going for time? Not too bad. So let's talk a little bit about filigree. So filigree wire work is where you make the basic round wire that I showed you. Two, two round wires, very fine, twisted together, nice tight twist. And usually when you make filigree wire work, you're working in fine silver, pure silver. You don't have to, but most filigree work is done in fine silver. There's a reason for that. In fact, there are a number of reasons. One is the fine silver has a higher melting temperature. So when you solder it into position, if you're very experienced, you'll not melt the wire because it's so delicate that the slightest overheating with sterling silver and, and soldering will burn, burn your object. So that's one reason. Another reason people work in fine silver is because when you bend the wire, which we're going to do now, um, have I annealed this? No, I haven't annealed this. So I'm going to anneal this with you now. If you bend the wire, in sterling silver, even after it's annealed, the memory of the wire, so the work hardening as you bend it, will make it spring out of the design you're trying to create. Whereas fine silver is so uh, soft and supple that it will uh, tend to hold the shape that you give it. And we'll, we'll experiment with this. This is sterling silver. So this will be really, really interesting to show you. I haven't done this on sterling before. So Chris, Fiona's asked, how do you calculate what size of twisted wire you want from two wires? Um, how do you calculate the size of, what, the size of wire you want uh, from two wires? Uh, difficult question. I'm not quite sure the specifics of the question. Um, you yes, you have to be... A bit more, Fiona, that'd be great. You have to sort of definitely know that if you've started with a certain size and you're doubling up, that your wire will be, yes, twice as thick when you finish. So with filigree wire, for instance, I tend to draw down to around about 0 0.3, 0 0.35 single wire, because when I double up 0.3, I'll end up with 0.6. Um, and... Um, that's fairly. That's actually fairly heavy for filigree, so uh, it it is experience really. Oh, really sticking to my mat here. Now, what I didn't say about this filigree wire is that after I've um, Pete's got me on the small camera there. After I've actually rolled this wire to hmm, give me a sample that will work. So after I've rolled this wire round, I've then flattened it in the draw plate. If you look very carefully, you'll see this is wide and thin. So by rolling this out through the rolling mill after twisting it, I end up with a flattened wire that's got a serpentine effect. And the wire has now, it's, it's almost like a two plat but I've squashed the two plat and the wire now locks into itself because it's actually flattened out. I'll just pop that in the pickle for a second, get my borax off. Um, just a couple so, of uh, more questions for you, Chris. Um, so Fiona, just, I'm just uh, elaborating on that previous question. So two wires yeah. and one mil will make two mil. That's the answer. Yeah, roughly two one mil wires will give you a two mil twist. 
and uh, Dawn asked about the length to your question mark. So essentially, you just make sure you use more than you need. Is that the story? Absolutely. It's it's quite scary how much why you need to produce a filigree. To give you an idea, when I was teaching at uh, Melbourne Polytechnic, we would draw out, the students would work in teams and we would draw wire that was six and eight metres long, almost 10 metres long. And we would chop that up into three sections of say three, two to three, two and a half, three metres each. And that three metres of wire, so we're talking about a wire wider than my arms width would make a tiny little pendant. Wow. Because once you twisted that wire around on itself, it just disappears. It goes nowhere. <laughs> well, so it's like a human's intestines are stretched all the way around the tennis court or something. It's very much like the old human intestines from, <laughs> from biology, biology days in year 12. That's right. And um, Daphne's asked, why do you always use the wire mats? Uh, I always use a, a, a mesh or a mat. I always elevate off the mat because the, the, the loss of heat to the mat, when you, when you lay a piece of wire or anything on your mat directly, you are, you are losing heat to the mat and you will overheat your metal. The minute you elevate the metal, you get the reflected heat from the mat and you get much more even heating and you don't have to go in with such a big flame. So you're really looking after your metal you're using less gas, you're getting reflected heat. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same story with, remember the, my, the famous tools that I don't like that I use all the time? It's like the same with the cross locks. Once you put the metal in the cross locks, where the cross locks touch the metal, you have to heat a lot, hot, lot hotter and you'll probably ruin your material. Whereas if you separate with binding wire, you've got the separation from the cross locks on your mat, you're gonna protect your metal. So you may lose a little bit of heat to the mesh, but you're not going to lose as much as you would to the mat. That's right. And the, by the, because the mesh is elevated by a millimetre or two off the mat, I'm getting that lovely reflected heat. It's, it's, it, the mesh heats up a little bit, but it certainly allows the heat to flow underneath. And uh, Sam asked, what, what is that mesh made of? Uh, stainless steel. Okay. Needs a clean. I just hot water it off. Once it gets too much borastic and borax, I just put it through the... Uh, boil it, the kettle and give it a brush off and ready to go again. So here's my filigree wire, the two twists rolled through the draw plate, uh, sorry, twisted, rolled through the rolling mill and flattened out to, a be, to be about, I'll measure it for you since we're in AJS week for measuring tools and marking <laughs> tools. Uh, we're 0.35 thick and we are 1.5 wide. So I've taken a double round wire of approximately, where's the one we were twisting up? Way too many samples in front of me here, Peter. I've, I've lost my way. Here we are. It was the big one, wasn't it? So this was about 1.2 round. So two, 0.6 wires have given me 1.2 as an overall dimension. And I roll that through the rolling mill down to 0.35 and I end up with 1.5. So that wire has given me this filigree. Now that filigree is um, 70 millimetres long. So I'm going to show you how to make that disappear very quickly. I'm going to get my little round nose. Where am I super, super round nose? Oh, these will do. And I'm going to start with one end and I'm going to make a circle with this filigree. So I'm going to wrap it around the finest point of my round nose pliers and start my circle. So this could be an interesting exercise if it works. Because normally you use pure silver to do this rather than sterling silver. Wrap that around. And I'm going to try to continue to wrap this around itself. 
So what, what do we start with? Point 70, 70 millimeters, seven centimeters. Here we go. I'm wrapping it around and I'm making a little snail shape. So it's just like a little snail shell. Yep, and it's doing exactly what I thought it would do. Because it's sterling silver, it's giving me a very open spiral. And if I had fine silver, that wouldn't happen because the fine silver won't work hard and as quickly as the sterling silver and it, my pat would be tighter. Oh, this is fantastic. It's going really well. It's just a slightly open spiral. So do you mind going to the other camera, please, Peter, and I'll show people where we're at. Thank you. So here I've got my little snail spiral. There's my wire, my filigree wire, which is just the double twist, serpentine twist. And I'm wrapping that up in a circle. So just holding it with the pliers and wrapping it around itself to create one tight little spiral reasonably tight spiral. And I might just say, just curve the end a little bit. And I could have say, you know, a peacock's wing or a butterfly. I could be making a butterfly filigree brooch. And that could be one of the little fronds of a flower or the arms of the butterfly wing coming off. Got a nice, nice little curve there. And then I've spiraled the wire down and you can actually see the gaps in the wire there. You can see where the spiral is and that the wire is actually springy. As I say, if this was uh, fine silver, there'd be no gaps, it would be very tight. But the effect is if I just turn on the right angle, you can start to see the shimmer you get because in filigree work, it's the little bump on the edge, the little twist from the round wire twisting that gives you the effect of the filigree. It gives you this brightness. To the, to, the, to the wire. Hence, important to keep your wire clean and bright, brassic. So I've now taken that seven centimeters of wire and turned it into a complete spiral with gaps. And that is now a nine millimeter spiral. So a factor of seven down to one. It's the wire is disappearing. Hence, if you do filigree, you'll need a lot of wire to um, to get that sort of that sort of result. But I'm I'm quite pleased with that. But the problem I've got here is the gaps. If I now go to solder that on, on a little base, the the gaps will flood with solder, and that's not what you want to do when you do filigree. You actually want to just place a little bit of solder, and you don't actually fill up the gaps at all because you, want, you don't want to flood filigree. You want the surface effect of the wire to be the effect that you're after. Well, I'm reasonably happy with that. So that's, in a nutshell, how you do a little, a little piece of filigree. It's like, like winding up a belt, you know, putting your belt away in your, um, in your cupboard. You're just basically winding the belt around itself. But the effect of the filigree is that little bright edge you get from the from the twisting the round wire. And to eliminate those gaps altogether, Chris. Yeah, if if again, I could, I guess I could anneal that and uh, and give it another squeeze. But as I say, that's why it's much better to have the fine silver because you won't have those gaps. Okay. This really does show you how uh, sterling silver does spring. The minute you start to work it, it, it starts to harden and therefore it starts to get springy. And Sarah made a comment, 22 carat yellow gold is brilliant. That's the go, isn't it, Sarah? <laughs> the, the, good, the good pure stuff. No, that's right. If you're working in gold, uh, absolutely beautiful. Uh, but yeah, the finer the material, the, the better result you'll, I imagine you'll get. So let's just do another bit of wire. Just to show you that lovely effect, I'll, do, I'll just twist up a piece of the flat rectangular wire. So I've drawn square wire, cut a piece off, and I've flattened that. So we've gone from square to a rectangle. I'm now going to put that back into the vise. I've got my little hook in there. That, that goes back into the vise. And it'll give that a nice little twist. 
and we'll get that beautiful decorative effect with the put those on. Just pull evenly and start twisting. A lot of fun, very therapeutic. It's just fantastic. It's fantastic to see the play of light, just to see how the light reacts to the to the uh, to the metal. So yeah, very important to keep your metal clean. Wow, that looks great. Really nice. A couple of other things to look out for. If you are twisting wire like this, just lost my end there. Just took it a bit too far. Um, what was I going to say? Um, so so that's, that's now twisted up beautifully. I've got really nice highlights on my wire. It's a beautiful shape. Yes, and what I was going to say was when you decide to use that decorative wire, let's say you're going to wrap around a gemstone, you have to be very conscious of the shape of the gem and the distortion on the wire. So one of the issues with rectangular wire is when you go around an oval gem or, a, say, a pear shape, as you bend the wire around the shape of the gem, because the gem is not a circle, you'll end up with... Um, a slightly flatter curve around the base of the, let's say it's a, um, a pear shape, where it curves around the bottom of the pear, the wire will be more stretched and the straighter sections of the pear where it comes to the point, the wire will have more of a twist on it. So you do have to be careful when you're wrapping around a gem that you take into account the distortion you're gonna get on the wire once you start to bend it. But the important thing is to, to, to start with a beautiful even shape. So to sort of, to, to, to recap a bit, prepare your wire well, get to the shape that you want, anneal it before you start to twist it. So make sure it's flat and annealed. Pull the wire before you twist it so it is straight. You can definitely stretch the wire a little bit. I'm not talking about pulling it a lot, just, just this, for, for a lot of people, it's quite an experience to, to get a piece of wire in the vise and pull it and feel your arm move the wire. So the wire goes from being nine centimetres long to 10 centimetres long. And that's quite an interesting sensation because it's, it's, it's quite a physical thing. It's not just a visual thing. It's, it's physical. And when you pull the wire, it automatically straightens. Uh, but if you pull the wire too much, then you stretch the wire and it tears and you ruin the fabric of the material. So it's a matter of just straightening it just a fraction and then twisting and continuing to keep the pressure on your wire as you're twisting it. And then you'll end up with a nice even twist. And once you believe you've twisted enough, which is that experience you need, you can stop, either wrap it in a circle if it's long enough or if it's a short piece of wire, you can just lay it out across the mat and very carefully flux it and anneal it and then continue your process on. So it's very process driven. Very therapeutic by the sounds of it. Chris. And very therapeutic. And you know, you can manipulate the wires a lot. I mean, this is a, a nice little infinity figure eight I did. This is- um, you want to Show that on the other camera? Yeah, you can show it on the other camera. This is, uh, which wire is this? This is actually square wire, which has been, twisted on itself. So it's two lots of square wire twisted together. And it's given you this sort of fabulous, it's even more twisty if you like than a rectangular wire. So you've got multiple facets. And I've just bent that up into a little infinity shape. Uh, yeah, it's a little sample I did with somebody recently, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just very, very effective. Uh, way of, of, of bending light, if you like, highlighting how light works on metal. Mm. This is another interesting sample. I'll get this as close as I can. This one is a double wire, double wire twist. So what I've done here is I've twisted a 0.9 wire on itself, and then I've done a 0.6 wire and twisted it twisted it into a double round wire. I'm just going to pull them apart so you can see the two wires. 
So I've got a 0.8 wire with a twist, round wire, and I've got a, a much smaller 0.5 or 0.6 wire with a twist. And then I've twisted the two together after twisting them. So there's two lots of wire producing a completely different pattern. You can see how busy and bright that is. Very hard for your eyes to see what the pattern is because there's so much going on. But again, you can experiment. You could use a lovely square wire with a round wire twist. Uh, you could use a rectangular wire and twist in a double round wire. And you get these fabulous shapes. They're really very pretty. You could make jump rings from this. You could make anything you want from it, a loop for a bale or a decorative edge for a gemstone or perhaps the decorative edge around a box, a silver box or something like that. So yeah, double wire round, double wire round, both independently twisted up to a certain, certain point and then both put together in the vise and twisted together to form this really quite extraordinary. It almost looks like that caudal chain you can buy. You can buy this sort of cord, what they call cordal chain, and it looks like that, but it's just a stiff, long wire. Yeah, fab fabulous. So what's the most popular sort of twist to do, Chris? Uh, look, I think definitely the double round is easy. Uh, my personal favourite is square wire. Uh, I just find the square wire, once you twist it, it's just, just fabulous. It just suddenly changes and has this um, really lovely uh, licorice twist to it. Uh, all these little bright highlights on it. It's so simple. If you think of a very straight piece of square wire and twisting it 30 times gives you something that looks very complicated and very busy. And you, all you've had to do is twist one of your arms. It's, <laughs> you know, it, it, it really is uh, very simple stuff. But visually, it's very effective. Uh, but for me, what's exciting about it as a teacher is that you, you have to go through so many processes to get there to understand the annealing and the, the, the initial process of drawing the wire out. But once you've actually made the rough material, that's when you can get excited about creating something in, in your designs, which is really useful to you. Oh, Chris, Susie's asked, when, when you are twisting two double wires together, is there a preferred direction for the pattern? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's because I'm right-handed that I tend to twist uh, in the clockwise direction, but that's uh, it's a really good point. Hey, look, works both ways as long as you continue the same way every time. Uh, it's a great question. It, it's a right-hand person's world, but... Um, no reason why you can't twist the other way. But I just think right-handed people tend to twist clockwise. Yeah. It's probably the way our brains are wired. But good <laughs> question, Susie. <laughs> yeah, just good. twist again like you did last summer. Sorry? I missed just, that. Just twist again like you did last summer. Good twist again last like summer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. So, so we're pretty this, well uh, wrapped up there. Chris. Yeah, I just was going to show people I've done my homework. Oh, I'll just show you a couple of quick samples again. Again, uh, you can make rings from wire. So this one um, is a double square wire, and that is unsolded, but it's two square wires bent around the mandrel into a ring shape. It is difficult to bring the ends nicely together. That's a, quite a... Uh, a trick is to make sure that the two square wires meet the other two square wires on the other side. Um, that's that's a challenge for you, but you know you can make a really interesting ring shape using twisted wire, no problem at all. Um, you know, just use perhaps a one one point two round wire or a one point two square wire, and you'll end up with something sufficiently thick enough to be a strong ring shape. So that's a double square. I was just going to show you my homework. Cool. Jumping track. This was a little bale we made last week, uh, two weeks ago, I should say. That was a little figure eight that we made. Yeah. And this just shows you it's now completed. I've, I've fully shaped it up and I've bent the fingertip end out. The finger goes on that end, it flicks it up off the ball at the end. And that opens up the end of the bale. And you can put that onto 
what have I got here? I've got a, um, oh, I've got a little rubber necklet that could fit over pearls. It could fit over a, this, this could be a um, chain. It fits over. I'm just going to squeeze that shut over the, the little ball at the end there. Click it down and, and there's your bail completed sitting on the Beautiful. bottom of the chain. So hopefully people had a bit of success getting their bales completed and they, they try to make a little uh, flexible figure eight bale. Functional, yeah, decorative. Well done, Chris. So um, well, we'll call it a wrap there and thanks everyone for their enthusiastic and positive comments and your uh, interaction through the demonstration, that's great. And thank you for your expertise. So uh, it's really great. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. I hope you give it a go. Uh, it's really a great learning curve, and uh, you'll it'll, it'll help inspire you. I'm sure. Keep that. Uh, keep friendly, happy, and uh, get out in that sunshine. Thanks very much, Chris. See you thank next. you, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks so much.